Hi, guys. Welcome to the How I Raise It podcast, the show where you get an inside, unfiltered look at how real entrepreneurs raise capital for their businesses. I'm your host, Nathan Beckard, and today's episode is with Raj Nathan of Startup Hype Man. Raj is a pitch and presentation coach. We get into his process for building a pitch. We get into examples of a killer elevator pitch, how to make your pitch entertaining, tips for pitching on Zoom, and much more. If you're tuning into this podcast, learn how to raise capital for your business, I've created a super valuable free welcome package for you. It includes a list of 2,500 investors who don't require a warm intro, plus 200 questions that investors are going to ask you. This is really going to help you get ready to raise capital. To get instant access to this, click the link in the first comment below. While you're there, please leave us a nice comment, what you like about this episode or this series in general. Last but not least, if you enjoy this conversation and think someone else would too, please share it with them and hit that subscribe button to get all our latest episodes. Thank you very much. Now sit back and enjoy the chat with Raj. Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by FoundersSuite.com. Today, I have Raj Nathan of Startup Hype Man coming to us from Chicago. How's your day going? It's going well. Just came off of working on a pitch, actually, right before jumping on this with you. Perfect. We're going to go deep into pitches on this episode. And, you know, pitch is so critical We'll get for start founders. People ask me, like, why do startups fail to raise capital? And the pitch is usually my number one topic, which will... You know, so we're going to get, go deep on pitches for for the audience here, but let's start off with who you are and what you do. What is Startup Hype Man? Yeah, so let me start with the who who I am, and then I can get into the what what I do and what we do. So um, I think to best understand or to know me would be to know that I honestly, like above all else, I realized several years back that like the thing I care about most, and I'm pretty sure the reason I'm on this earth is this burning desire and belief that like everyone deserves a voice. Now you got to use your voice responsibly, responsibly but uh, you, I, I genuinely believe that everyone deserves a voice. And I think the thing that like actually eats at me the most is when I see someone feel like they cannot be themselves or they're not allowed to be themselves or they just don't, they, they feel like they don't have a voice. So when I realized that several years back, I was like, wait, everything I'm consciously doing and subconsciously like interested in all seems to stem from this. And I was like, okay, I think... And then I realized I was like, wait, everything that I'm doing to help with that, whether it's a personal thing or a professional thing or a passion, is all some form of like voice creation and storytelling. And so that's fueled like kind of all my pursuits again whether i've been conscious of it or not but when i realized it i was like wait this is cool I, like my, everything I, I love revolves around this core concept and so that's allowed me to like just make more informed decisions as i've as i've uh, you know grown over the years so um functionally i do several things um and i will culminate at probably the reason why we're having this conversation today but um in my swath of activities i teach yoga I uh, am a professional ring announcer for MMA. I am a hip hop artist, and I actually combine all that experience to help run my company, which is called Startup Hype Man. And Startup Hype Man is intently focused on really being a hype man for startups. How? <laughs> By helping them not suck at how they pitch themselves. And most often, that is for the purpose of fundraising. Uh, it also, Ends up being for companies who want to scale and grow up their and, and grow their sales function and figuring out how do they pitch themselves to their customers as well. But all of it is centered around helping them not suck at that core skill and that core storytelling me mechanism, um, so they stand out, stand apart, and you know, as I like to say, get their audience to see them not as the best but as the only. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. So on a on a purely you know like. The money you use to pay rent and buy groceries is coming from coaching entrepreneurs on pitches or building decks for them or some combination of both. Is it, you know, is it sort of you tell me actually? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, we, I mean, we run startups and founders through a very specific process, but we will create like their elevator pitch. We'll figure out the story for their pitch deck. We'll design the pitch deck. We'll create their kind of like their founder story or help them fine tune their founder story. Um, right. So we've got this whole process. We call it your standout pitch kit. 
uh, but we're able to give that to them and we work collaboratively with them on, we're able to give that to them. And then they are able to take that story, that pitch, internalize it, and then go out and start pitching their company, whether it's to investors or in pitch competitions, you know, or to get grant money, to get into accelerators, right? There's a lot of different ways you can uh, acquire capital or, or take your company to the next level. But that's, you know, that's the primary, uh, I guess, literal, you said groceries. So I guess that's the primary breadwinning yeah. <laughs> function of, of the company. <laughs> that's cool. And how many, just to, to give uh, audience members a, a taste, how many pitch decks are you working on or how many stories are you working on in any given week? We are probably working on between elevator pitches and pitch decks. We're probably working on, I'd say like in a slow week, it's going to be like three to five in a week in a faster week or a heavier week, somewhere between like five and 10. Um, and so, you know, it's been cool because it's, it's allowed me to be able to scale the company. And now we've got, you know, my, my, my title is founder and chief pitch artist, but uh, we got two other pitch artists on staff. Now uh, we've got a design team. They are design artists. Um, the person who writes the brand manifesto, which is that founder story aspect. That's the content artist. And so it's cool because we've got a whole team that's being able to support a founder in their journey now. Yeah, cool. All right. Let's, you know, there's so many questions I want to ask about pitch decks and presentations and storytelling, but let's just go into it. Why are most pitch decks terrible? I have seen a lot of pitch decks in my day and I see a lot every week. And, and I think the fundamental issue is that most of these pitch decks, they don't tell a very good story or they don't tell a story at all. Um, it's very product focused. And in not telling a story and being product focused, I believe it becomes, even if you have a great idea or a great prototype, or you've even got some traction, you're seen more for your risk than your opportunity or your potential. And your company becomes highly or more easily refutable in the eyes of an investor or a funding party. Okay. Uh, all right. You want to go into that a little more? What does that, what does that really mean? What is that? Yeah. So I think a really strong pitch deck is one. So let me give you an idea, right? There, there's yeah. kind of like when, when there is a story, there is the traditional route of like, you know, meet Nathan. Nathan runs a company. Nathan is stressed looking at five different accounting options. What should Nathan do? Oh, meet the all-in-one accounting solution, right? That, that's kind of like almost like the Cinderella style of storytelling, as I call it. And that can work. And I think if it's going to work, it makes more sense in like a pitch competition where you've got an audience, you're on a stage, you've got like three, four minutes, and you're trying to like just generate some goodwill with the crowd at large. But I think that's kind of like level one of storytelling. The advanced storytelling is one where your deck is really more than anything, it's your point of view on the industry and where things are going or, and where things need to go, whereby you just so happen to have the perfect product that's going to push the industry in that direction five or 10 years faster than it was ever going to get there on its own. Or maybe it was never going to get there on its own were it not for this thing that you have. But you actually end up making the story less about the, like explaining the product and more about these like market forces and conditions and trends that are starting to like bubble up and push things a certain way. And because of those things, you've got, again, you, ha you just have to have the good product or like, the right product. You've got a clear go-to-market strategy. And that ends up showing that like you're a very or you're the most viable option out there for how this thing can be solved. Um, the way to look at it is like, you know, I think the best impact you can have on the listening party is one where they say to themselves, "Huh, you know, I never thought of it like that before. That's really interesting. We need to keep mm -hmm. talking to them." Interesting. If you can tell a story that has that impact, you've taught them, right? And when you can put them in a situation where you teach them, you're getting them to recognize something about reality that they hadn't considered before. You're, you're showing a specific lens on reality that they had never thought of before. And that builds a lot of intrigue and it helps establish you as the founder, as a thought leader in that space. And I'm sure, Nathan, you, you've seen this before and you've heard this before. You know, 10 out of 10 investors will be like, we bet on the person, not the product. Well, I think one of the best ways, if not the best way, 
to get to say, hey, bet on this person is to be able to have that impact on them where you, in effect, ultimately position yourself as a thought leader in the space. Because they're like, well, this person, they don't just have the idea or the product. They're seeing, you know, they're seeing through the lanes. It's like, it's like in the matrix, um, you know, when he's like red pill or blue pill, take the red pill. I'll show you just how far this rabbit hole goes. You're kind of, you're, you're able to tell a story that unveils the matrix for them. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. How, so let's get into the weeds. How do you get there with your story? Cause that is, I love that idea. Right. I, I have had those pitches where it really makes you go, guys, this is, this is really intriguing. I'm really thinking about the universe and the world differently after hearing your pitch. It wasn't just, here's what we do, blah, 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 blah. I was like, I'm mm-hmm. you know, really intrigued, but that's hard. So how do you get there? Do you have a framework? Do you have a methodology? How does, you know, what's some of the secret sauce when you take on a client to, to guide them or extract that? The step one is always, let's figure out the elevator pitch. Right. What's that 30 to 60 second upfront introduction? Mm-hmm. Um, because if you can't get that right, it's like if you can't capture value up front, uh, I feel like your chances of success when you have a deck are greatly limited, mainly because the elevator pitch, aside from being an upfront value prop, really is the foundation for like the message that you're trying to deliver. And so if you can tap into that like, ahead of time, it actually makes creating the deck way easier. So the formula that we use every single time I call que pasa. It's the que pasa elevator pitch formula, which if you know Spanish, you know, que pasa means what's up or what's happening. And that's what you got to do, right? When you're delivering that upfront elevator pitch is just tell people what's up. Because I'll tell you like the vast majority, you know, and anytime a company works with us, like first thing I'll do is I'll be like, all right, give me your elevator pitch, go. Vast majority of founders will say something to the effect of like, uh, we're an AI load delivery platform that specializes in NLP programming for the, uh, you know, for the logistics industry, and um, you know our our AI can deliver three times as fast as the industry standard. Um, and we've got you know insert buzzword X and Y here, and we were also you know we've generated interest and we've gotten backing from the f- uh, investors in Duolingo and and. Uh, puppy lingo, which is Duolingo for puppy, you know, some, some, some nonsense like that, where by the end, you're just incredibly confused as to what they do. It's like they said a lot, but they didn't say anything in saying a yeah, lot. Right. Totally. Mm-hmm. And I think there's this push from a lot of founders to be like, I got to use all the jargon words possible to make this sound interesting. And it just makes it sound confusing and long winded as well. Like they don't have a clear idea of when they want to stop talking. So it drags on yeah. or conversely, they say so little that you don't know enough. And then you're like, wait, what? Like they, like they just rely on a one liner. And then that just leaves people like, like, wait, huh? Right. Um, the other way I see it done is, ju- is leaning on a analogy, leaning on, oh, we're the Uber for this. We're the yeah, yeah. for that, which I'm also, I mean, there's varying opinions on it. I personally am not an advocate of that for a couple reasons. One is, you know, by saying, let's, for example, because that's a common one, right? Oh, we're Uber for this industry. You kind of just bring up associations of what that company is doing, like positive or negative PR. Like you, you don't want like that drafting off onto you. Sure. Uh, at this, and, and on top of that, you don't know where that company is going. So, I mean, like when, you know, Uber's valuation gets slashed because of a bad market. And then now you're saying, oh, we're Uber for that. What you're implying is, we are a company that will not survive or, or will get greatly devalued in a, in a down market, in a bear market. I also think it's a bad crutch to lean on because oftentimes it's not the right correlation. And it actually, I think, damages the founder's um, ability to build their own company. So like you know, an example from a few years back, there was someone I knew who had built this on-demand photography company. So like, I don't know, you go out for a round of golf with your friends and you're like, hey, we should get a photographer while we're playing 18 holes together. And it's like, oh, I'll use, I'll use this, this app and I'll get a photographer sent over to us and they'll capture some photos for the day. Or, oh, I, oh, I, need, a, I need photos of this baby shower, right? Stuff like that. And they were dead set on saying Uber for photography because is it on demand? Yes. However, one of the things that that leads you to do is create false assumptions about how the market will behave. Mm. Because in the case of Uber, a big part of their success was that by hook or by crook, by whether you're going to walk, take the bus, 
uh, take the train or take a car. You got to get to work every day. You got to get to where you're going every day. Converse, like, like it's, a, it's a commodity, right? Transportation yeah. is a commodity. Conversely, I don't need to have a photographer every day, right? I'm not, I'm not like something who like follows me around like the paparazzi. Uh, and and not most yet. Although aren't. I think yeah, you're on yeah. that track. Yeah. <laughs> most people, most people aren't, right? And so you create this false assumption about your company that the market's going to behave in the same way. But like for photography, the reorder rate is like once a year, right? Maybe a couple of times. I mean, maybe the product's successful. You get it to a point where people reorder a few times in a year. But that's not like like people use Uber literally every day or at minimum like once a week, right? So it creates this false assumption of how your market's going to behave as well. So Long-winded way of saying those are some of the challenges I see with with existing elevator pitches, either wrong analogy, too short, or too long with too many buzzwords. The methodology we've created, as I said before, is KPASA, the KPASA elevator pitch formula. And the acronym in that is P-A-S-A, which stands for Problem, Approach, Solution, Action. Mm -hmm. Problem, Approach, Solution, Action. The reason why this works so well, and, and this formula I created it several years back, and it, it's designed to be delivered in 60 seconds or less, is you're able to provide context and frame of reference for why you should even exist up front. And more than anything, you generate a source or a, a form of empathy with the listening audience before you come in and talk about your product or your, your service or your solution or your offering. So you, it, it's, it's a way of communicating that taps into emotion first. And I'll tell you what doesn't have emotion to it is when, and I'm sure you've heard this before in all the pitches you've seen, someone will start by being like, um, let's see here. Um, air travel is a $78 billion industry. Like That's like line one that they'll say. The problem with that is first off, it's table stakes. It should be table stakes that you're in an industry that is of a decently large size, right? It's like you probably shouldn't be trying to raise money for like a declining fax machine industry. <laughs> but on top of that, it being table stakes, there is, it's impossible to generate any sort of emotion out of say out of opening with this is a seventy eight billion dollar industry because we can't picture that at all, right? Like you can't picture. 78 billion or 1 billion of anything, right? Um, I think the most we're capable of picturing is like, what does a large stadium look like? Like the big house at the University of Michigan is like 120,000 people, I think it can fit. That's like the most we're really capable of picturing in our heads. And even that's like a sea, it's like a blob of people, right? So your problem statement really should be able to dial it in at like the value of one person, the value of one. And then you can extract it out later on into this is felt by you know this many people or you know the industry is this big, but you got to dial it into the value of one up front. And again, when you lead there, now you've got emotion as the lead, and then you'll justify it later with the reason. And now when you can tap into emotion up front, it's going to make understanding your product so much easier because you know and this is something that my dad says all the time and. He's an engineer and he um, grew up and went to school in India. And one of the things that they said in engineering colleges there, which I think is exactly applicable to communication here, is a well-defined problem is already half solved. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. right. So if you can really articulate the problem up front, you actually don't need to say so much about your solution because it's already starting to become clear. It's already revealing itself in how well you're describing the problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. Interesting. Uh, very cool. So that's sort of step one is is honing the elevator pitch using this K-Pasa. What's step two and three? Is there do you have is there more to a process towards the goal of the killer pitch deck? <laughs> yeah. So I think so. Again, we we always like to start there. It's like let's get that upfront value prop taken care of, and then that kind of lays the foundation for a really strong pitch deck. So some of the things that some of the techniques we like to layer into pitch decks, and I talked before about like being able to build up market forces, is not starting with a problem slide, but in that long form, you know, in that presentation mode, having like two to three slides up front that kind of like set the terms for like where is this universe or where is this world at today, mm -hmm. and what's happening. That then crescendo, like like what friction is taking place, and then you crescendo at the problem slide. 
Mm. So, and, and and what's really important here is th- this is where you start to help them recognize, like, and get them to begin thinking of things differently, or you show them that lens they hadn't considered before. Um, where you think about like what are what are larger trends at play that are being echoed, maybe not just directly in the pinpoint thing that you're focused on, but that say like in a way like society is moving in this direction. Um, so one example, and this is actually one they actually they just messaged a couple of days ago there, that they got their first hundred k. They just opened up their round and got a hundred k in in their initial funding pretty quickly. Um, but I'm trying to think of how I can talk about it without specifically because they're kind of like in stealth mode at the same time. Um, but essentially, it's it's an app that's able to bring more authenticity into online dating and app dating. Now, the Cinderella way of telling that story would be like, you know, meet meet Nathan, right? Let's assume Nathan, you're not married, you don't have kids. Let's assume you're still a single guy, right? It'd be like meet Nathan. Um, you know, Nathan is single. Nathan has five different opportunities to go on a date. Nathan is stressed, right? <laughs> Which can it help describe the product? Sure. Does it still become pretty refutable? Yeah. So instead, what we build up is this upfront story across a few slides about how the world is becoming more authentic. Look at how hashtag no filter is more popular than using filters on Instagram. Look at how um, celebrities are breaking barriers between like with like accessibility to their fans. Look at how um, literally like blockchain technology is a new platform design and like NFTs are designed to create more authenticity between creator and consumer. So it's like this idea of authenticity is pitched up front as here's the world that is that we've now entered into. And then we say, amidst all of this, dating is somehow still completely inauthentic. Even though there's more options for dating, you're getting more catfishing, you're getting more um, like people um, saying they're something, but then in reality, they're not. They, they claim they have these hobbies and interests, but they don't actually ever like do those things, right? And so while the world is moving in this direction, dating hasn't tipped yet, but it's next to fall in line. And here's the big problem. And then here's what we do about it. And then you start to move forward from there. Yeah, I like that. Much more macro trends, forces colliding, and here's the problem we're solving versus just here's the problem we're solving. Kind of much more gravitas, much more you know, big wave coming versus just here's how yeah. we are surfing. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's kind of being like, look, this industry that now we've focused on is not going to be able to operate in the current way it has been operating because all these other things have already tipped. And this thing has not tipped yet, but it's going to trust me. Like, and it's hard to refute that given everything else that's been happening. Right. And so that means like something's got to be done about it. We've got the thing to do about it. Yeah. That's interesting. Do you have, and you can skip this question because I know probably some of this is confidential, but like, do you have a killer? Do you remember what elevator pitch you landed on for those guys? Or if not them, do you have like a killer elevator pitch for a, a client that you you can kind of share just so you can like hear what that the, sounds like? The only thing that I, I wish I could share that one, but because of some like specific things about the ter- their technology, like they, they don't want to yeah. uh, have that publicly promoted yet. Um, but there are actually a lot of other elevator pitches I can share with you. Let me give you another one. Actually, this is one we just created very recently. Um, I'm going to pull it up here. Yeah, it's always useful when when people like literally hear, even if it doesn't apply to their business in any way, just hear what a good one sounds like. Use it as a archetype, right? Yep. 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 Okay. So this is a company that operates in um, the sports betting arena. Touchdown. Home run. Goal, buckets. Each of these moments carries more weight when you've got money on the line, which means you can't afford to lose time just trying to figure out who has the best line. You also can't afford to lose concentration switching between two fantasy leagues, three DFS apps, and four sports books. Because if you do, you lose, period. Get all your action without ever missing any of the action with better vision. 
See exactly who has the best odds across sports books. Find out what promotional offers you're missing out on and track your performance from player to point spread all in one place so that every bet counts. So that's problem approach solution. Now in the action step of KPASA, now we start to extract it out to the market, right? Or, or make it like a bigger issue. 74 million Americans play fantasy sports or bet on sports. Over 70% of them do both and use multiple accounts. These numbers are only getting bigger as more states legalize sports betting. And we're raising capital to give everyone a connected experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I like it. And, and it's funny. The first portion of that sounds like it could also be used as their marketing pitch to customers, but it yeah. works for investors as well, especially when you tack on the second portion of that with the market sizing and stuff like that. It's kind of interesting. Totally. And you know, like a customer, you know, for a customer thing, like you just cut out that last part and it's just, you just go straight to like download the app, right? You don't have to talk about the market size, but, but you capture someone up front and, and get them to like, think about, right. I, I have to imagine you started, you started thinking about a touchdown or a home run being hit or, 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 you know, or a three pointer being made. Right. So you, you start, you allow them to see themselves within the, like the situation yeah, I like that line. You know, touchdown is more. I don't know exactly what your words were, but more impactful when you've got money on the line. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. like, each, yeah. Yeah, each of these moments carries more weight when you've got money on the line. Yeah, more weight. Good, great, 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 great. Um, okay, good. Any, I want to have some other questions, but any more on the process of getting the pitch deck? We've kind of covered step one and two. Any, you know, can you round? Yeah, out? yeah, definitely. So, like another thing that's really important in a pitch deck is being able to articulate your go-to-market strategy. Okay. Um, there are sometimes I will run into entrepreneurs where I will ask them a question about their, you know, their traction strategy, their go-to-market, and they'll just be like, "Oh, social media." Okay, what about social media? And then it's like deer in a headlights look in response. We're gonna go viral. Simple yeah, that. right. <laughs> um, I had someone once be like, and I was like, "Oh, like traction? How are you gonna monetize?" And it was, "Oh, we'll run ads." And I'm like. Okay, to what kind of advertisers? And like, oh, anyone could advertise on this platform. And I'm and I'm talking to them and I'm like, just so you're aware, the most successful modern advertising platform I would say is Facebook. It took them like 7 years or 5 years, whatever it was, before they ever released ads because they knew it couldn't hurt they couldn't damage the user experience while they were still gaining critical mass and there also had to be enough users with enough activity for it to be worthwhile to an advertiser you're standing here and you're telling me that on day 5 when you've got 9 users you're going to attract advertisers why would they buy from you right what value could you possibly bring them so things like that and i get animated about that cuz like when i hear responses like that it all, like it really bothers me cuz cuz it's like why would anyone give you money yeah, yeah. I don't care if you've got a good product. If you don't know how you're going to bring it to market, what you know, you're you're kind of throwing. It's irresponsible for you to take on someone's money. So, yep. you really want to get good at articulating your go-to-market strategy. Um, and the more you can like fine-tune that, the better. So, like um, another common one that I think is a great go-to-market strategy is establishing partnerships. But you have to know for your company. What does a partnership equal? I think a lot of founders have in their head this idea like, oh, we're going to establish partnerships you know, with whatever organizations that are in the industry. But they, if you then ask the follow-up, okay, what does a partnership look like? In their minds, they think that like, oh, we're going to reach out to these people and they're going to give us access to their databases and we're going to get tons of users. And it's like, eh, it doesn't really work like that. You know, like X professional member organization doesn't just freely give out their database to people who ask. Um, so being able to better fine tune even that, like, okay, well, for us, a partnership looks like this. Um, you know, we connect with entities in this field. Um, we run a content activation with them, um, right? And then so they, their win is going to be this, our win is going to be this, and that's going to bring users onto the platform. Right? That's a that's a more clear strategy. Or being able to say, like, actually, with the one I talked about earlier with the with the dating app, being like. We've identified these 10 universities as our, as our initial go-to-market for the reason that they have this gender uh, split at their, at their, uh, within their student population. And then these are the top fraternities and sororities at these universities. And not only... It, it, it's like they share... like th Their top Greek life is shared across universities. So I'm, I'm not familiar with Greek life too well because I was never in it. But it's like Delta Kappa Nu at this college mm -hmm. is the top chapter 
there, but also at these three other colleges. So we know if we can get into one, then getting into the other chapters is easier because we've we've got a common introduction point from working with one university. Yeah. Right. So that level of like specificity is really valuable to be like, okay, these people don't just have a good product. They know what they're doing with it. Being in the midst of a recession as funding starts to slow down or gets pulled back a bit, I think this technique becomes even more and more uh, of a need where you teach them, teach your audience how they should be measuring your success. Because an investor, a funding group is for the most part only capable of trying to validate you based on their past understanding of other companies. And if other companies are getting their valuations slashed and maybe aren't doing so hot, you've got to figure out a new way to like plant the seed in their head to be like, and almost like redirect and be like, here's the key focus, right? So um, when when you factor that in, like a, here's a, a side anecdote. I wrote a post about this recently. Um, you're familiar with the Billboard Music Group, right? So you know they've been around for a long time, like literally like late 1800s, I believe. The Billboard Music Group was created. Mm. Now, their metric in the streaming era for measuring an artist's success, they created some metric called an AEU, which is the is, it stands for Album Equivalent Unit, which is like a pretty piss poor metric. <laughs> They're basically saying like, hey, in the age of streaming, where people can access music on demand in their phone, they can create playlists however they want, right? And even and and as a result, artists have shifted how they make music altogether. We're going to measure success off this idea of what's the likelihood a listener would go to Sam Goody in 1996 and buy this CD, right? That's a terrible metric. <laughs> and I have to imagine that because of that being a leading metric, there are artists who have been more or less like industry pushed down when they should be rising up and could be more successful and famous than they are. But Billboard is not capable of understanding how they should be measuring the future. So the best they can do is figure out, well, how did we measure the past and how do we co-opt that to measure the right now in the future? So AEU is our metric, even though again, like, why are you measuring the equivalent of like a CD sale where you had to physically go somewhere to say that's what that's what success equals? So, you know, let's say you were now pitching this fictitious billboard investment group and you were an artist. Uh, you'd have, you know, they they probably ask you, okay, what are your projected AEUs? And so, what you what you want to do is um, redirect or reframe acknowledge their starting point and then play up the future that you're trying to create. So you you know maybe you'd say something like so what we're really focused on so reframe right what we're what we know from our last album or from our last project is that the you know the hook from our single was used in uh you know 2 million TikTok videos and the likelihood that someone would then see that and then create it in their own TikTok and use it themselves was like seven out of every 10. Mm. And that and that ability to be in TikToks is what uh, helps unlock and establish uh, brand partnerships. So as it pertains to AEUs, we're only projecting X, you know, we're only projecting X thousand. And that's actually a really good thing because we know we only need to sell X thousand AEUs in order to get this virality in the market and unlock these highly lucrative brand partnerships, which is our real revenue opportunity. right? So you take the, the focus from only selling a few albums to being like, well, we don't need to sell that many because of these reasons, because we're focused on you know, how people create with music, you know, how a fan takes a song and then creates something on their own with it. Um, that, that company I gave you the elevator pitch of earlier, Better Vision, that's something that we've instituted into their pitch, which was like, you know, they, they had this, they have this key metric of, um, I don't remember exactly. Let's just say it's like, I don't know. I think it was like 40,000 users in five months, something like that. Um, but for them to make revenue, they, they got to have way more than yeah. that. Um, cause their revenue model is getting these like sports book operators on the platform, right? Stuff like that. Um, so the, using this technique, right? And reframing. And actually, when I mapped it out, I was like, oh, it's the RAP framework, right? You wrap to them, reframe, acknowledge, and play up. Mm. Um, you know, an investor is likely going to say, all right, like, you know, what are your, what are your user acquisition goals? And you could say, oh, you know, we're projecting 40,000 users in five months, which there's a high likelihood that falls flat or it's like, ah, that's not enough, right? So instead, what you have to do is reframe and be like, what we know determines success about our platform is stickiness, 
Sure. Which is why we're actually we've designed this in a way where as a as a a, a sports better starts tracking their bets across all their sports books on our platform, we're actually able to take that data and establish a win rate score for them across all the betting that they're doing. Which means we can say that this that, that you, if you're a user, hey, you're pretty good. Your win rate score is 72%. But now if I'm on the app, I actually look at you and I say, wow, Nathan's got a 72%. I should start tracking his bets and maybe making my bets in a similar way that he's making his bets. It's because I want to increase my win rate score. And now, Nathan, you're more incentivized to use the app because you've got some social influence now. People are looking to you as a, you know, as a betting influencer, essentially. And now you want to bring your friends onto the app as a result. So the, the ability to generate win rate scores is our number one metric for stickiness. So as it pertains to overall users, we're looking at 40,000 in in, over the first five months. And that's the perfect amount to be able to generate these win rate scores, which allows us to amplify over time and get way more users, making it sticky from the start. And that's where we start to get these uh, sports books and these betting operators onto the platform who want to see how does the industry move and shake. Yeah, interesting. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Okay, I don't want to keep you all day because I'm sure we could talk for hours. Um, <laughs> anything, anything else on process? Just to kind of wrap that up uh, that we haven't covered there. Uh, I think those are some good ways to get going. But I, think I, I have a two, few more questions I want to get to, but it, just to put a button in that or pin in. I'd that. say just like two quick other things to think about in your pitch deck is how you're showcasing yourself versus the competition. Mm -hmm. We're big fans of pitching category creation whenever possible. And we dogmatically avoid using the four quadrant competitive analysis mm -hmm. slide. Yep. Because my belief is everyone knows you've just labeled the axes <laughs> in a certain way. So that, that way you are in the you are up and to the right. Yep. And then on top of that, it's just kind of it's like it's really irrefutable, right? To come back to that word, it's really refutable because it's like, all right, what if that company in the top left does this one thing and they're in your they're in your quadrant? But, and on top of that, I also feel like it's inherently contradictory because your whole pitch is to be pitching the idea for the way the world is supposed to be. But then you're like, and here's how we fit into the world that was. Mm, yeah. So it's inherently contradictory. Um, the feature table is the other one a lot of times companies will use. And I think that's also ineffective because it assumes, it assumes success boils down to having two more features than the existing players that are out there. Yep. And more features does not equal more success. So we, we try to avoid those kinds of slides and instead just pitch like, hey, we're creating an entirely new category. Everyone else is over here doing this. That's fine. Let them do it. It's actually going to work to our advantage. We're over here creating this category. And you, and you just got to like commit to that as well. You can't like then if they ask a follow-up question, then you can't just be like, oh, well, actually what I mean is we're in this quadrant, they're in that quadrant. Like You got to commit and believe in what you're saying. And then the last thing I think I want to touch on is your personal founder story. Be able to share a short anecdote beyond just your professional acumen. So a great example of this is um, his name is Scott DeGrossier. He's the founder of this company called Wicked Reports, which is a, they take all like your online marketing data and they are able to figure out your true ROI attribution of your online marketing and your offline marketing. So it's essentially like predictive models, predictive data models, right? And so it's one thing to like just talk about his professional acumen, but what he was able to do there and what we helped him create was like, like why you, right? When why you, but no, and no one else. And so the, the micro story, the micro anecdote he, he, he told was about how um, when he was like, data is all he's ever known. When he was 13 years old, his grandfather took him to the horse racing track just oh. to like have some fun for the day. And Scott, spent, I already love this story. You're right? just, you're four <laughs> words into it. And I love it already. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and Scott spent the entire day with a notebook on his lap drawing out predictive models based on the gambling odds. And his grandpa, after a couple hours, had to pull him out of the track because he was 13 years old and winning money and he can't be betting. <laughs> and then, you know, a few years later, he got kicked out of his first fantasy baseball league because before ESPN and Yahoo had automatic, you know, predictive stats, he was doing it by hand and he put together the best money ball kind of team. And everyone else is like, you're cheating. We're kicking you out. And that <laughs> led, great, you know, yeah. ultimately led him to managing the a terabyte of data at apartments.com, which then you know leads him to Wicked Reports, which is really just 
the next evolution of his brain, which is the only thing he's ever done, which has been around data and building out predictive models. And so when you can tell a short story like that, it proves it's like, this is not something fun that I'm doing because it looks convenient or cool. This is in my DNA. I don't know how to operate anyone else and no one else but me could be doing this. Yeah, I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. That's cool. That's interesting. That's good. That's good. Um, I know it's funny when I tell, talk about Founders Street, like part of my story is like, I've never, I'm never done anything else other than raise capital for startups. Like I don't know how to do anything else. Like if I, <laughs> if this doesn't work out, I have nothing else to fall back on. Cause I have yeah. no other skills. And I, uh, yeah. So, yeah. But I also probably need to weave in the, why, you know, why I'm the only one that could do it. Anyway, that's beyond. Yeah. Beyond well, point. and when I think, you know, you were on my podcast recently and I think like your, your mountain climbing background is like, Somebody in Kilimanjaro. I think that, like, something like that can be layered into how, you know, you, you, by default, you take on uphill challenges and you, you attack those challenges and you succeed in those uphill challenges. I like it. I like it. That's good. I like that. Yeah. Cool. I like it. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Um, okay. I have a couple more kind of shorter form and I want to be mindful of your, of the time here. You know, one of the things I'm always telling founders is putting, you know, I, I tell them to kind of, Put themselves in the in the shoes of the investor that the investors they're pitching are getting 50 to 100 intros a day to startups 50 pitch decks coming their way they're they're meeting with or having zoom calls or face-to-face pitches with 20 to 40 pitch you know 40 companies a week and so i, I kind of think of it as like what's the half-life of your pitch like what are they going to remember a week or two later in the context of having sat through 39 other pitches. So I guess here's my question. What are any tips or tactics for making your pitch memorable and entertaining? Like how do you be the one that they remember a week later after sitting through 39 other pitches? Yeah. Um, I think my quick answers on this are, as I mentioned before, clearly articulated problem, um, having a good founder story, and then also being able to deliver numbers in the right context. So an example, we just did this yesterday with the deck was being able to say, hey, this number is as big as Australia's GDP. And, and, and all we're talking about when we say this number is like a, a select subset of citizens in the United States. That, you know, that financial number is as big as Australia's GDP. So when you can talk about numbers in ways like that, now the numbers have context around them. And it's like, whoa, okay. That's a memorable thing to be like, oh yeah, the market is as big as an entire country instead of just saying, oh, it's an X billion or whatever, an X trillion dollar market. Yeah. Okay. That's good. That's good. I think, well, okay. Let me ask something like slightly different, but related. Like, Mm -hmm. do you advise or do you not like, do you recommend founders use any gimmicks to make their pitch memorable? And let me give you one example. And this is from- Years ago, but it sticks out in my mind, which is obviously making it very memorable. I was at a pitch uh, competition at University of Texas, and this company was, I don't even remember what they were doing exactly, but it was some women's health focused product. And they brought out a speculum, which is for doing examinations on women, and they like tossed it to one of the judges in the front <laughs> row. Like, look at what women have to go through. And yeah, the judge like, oh my God, you know, I've got this thing, this device, which. Yeah is very uh uh invading <laughs> yeah but it, was, it was like the most memorable pitch and they're like i don't know do you, do you recommend or or do you like any i think for like especially like for those on stage ones yes do the things that people are going to remember a year from now um one of our companies a couple years back when they were pitching like they were trying they, they literally brought like the thanos glove from uh the avengers and like they wore that on stage and like did like a, a motion and like the sly had like a bite taken out of it when they went like this. Oh, interesting. Right. Mm-hmm. And like stuff like that, the crowd will get hooked into that. It'll it creates like a visual stamp in people's heads. And even if you don't go like the full, you know, gimmick route, um, and I will say, like, the gimmick should relate. It's not a gimmick for the sake of gimmick, it's a gimmick for the sake of better understanding, you know, the value of the company. The other thing that is um you never want to have a slide that has a neutral header. Mm. Um, meaning your slide should like the, the title of each slide should be the concluding or the takeaway thought you want them to have about the information on that slide. That's yeah. how you get them to see things through your lens and your narrative gets across the most. Cause otherwise, you know, if you just have a slide that says like customer acquisition, mm. now they get to decide 
what do they believe about your customer acquisition versus uh, there was a pitch competition yeah. I was judging or um, I was emceeing last year. And I still remember this the, the winning company, their customer acquisition slide, the title of it was, we are very good at acquiring customers quickly and profitably. Mm-hmm. It's really hard now to think about anything other than that company is good at quick acquiring customers quickly and profitably. Right. So you direct the lens, you direct the information and get them to see your perspective on it. Whereas if it's neutral, again, they decide what they want to take away or learn or know about your company in each of those points. And again, it's been a I think over a year at this point. And I still remember that exact slide header and that exact company. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I like that. That's a key key to okay. Last two. Um, any specific tips for pitching over Zoom, which is still, you know, quite a yeah. thing, even if we're sort of post pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think what can really help is like invest. It's not that much money. Invest a hundred, two hundred dollars into a good, into a well lit, like a, a good lighting setup. Whether that means if you're at home moving your desk, like so there's a window behind the computer and your face is well lit or getting one of those ring lights or something like that. Make yourself well lit. If you're using your laptop, get an external HD webcam so you show up in 1080p and not like 720 or 540p. Um, Depending on available space around you, let your background be a window into your personality. Mm. Um, So I, you know, I just moved into a new office, so I haven't adjusted everything yet. But like, here I'll, I'll rotate the screen. Like that's usually what's in my background: a wrestling Mm -hmm. championship belt, some books, an air sign, right? Like it lets people know who I am. Um, and then it's not a bad idea to change the height of your desk, whether you've got a standing desk or you put your monitor on some boxes so that you are standing up while talking. Your energy level will change mm. for the better, right? Make yourself, if you're not, especially if you're not like by default a speaker, um, stand up and talk. You'll be able to use your hands a lot more naturally. Uh, and your overall energy you bring to that pitch will, will be at the right level for you. Those are good. Those are interesting. Yeah. Those are really interesting. Okay. Last tip for, I think a lot of founders, even myself, I've built lots of pitch decks, sometimes struggle with getting going. Like, where do I start? I've got it. I've got it. I know I got to put together a deck. Um, how do I start? Do I just open up PowerPoint and start sketching out any tips for getting going really kind of overcoming the inertia, I guess you could say. It's a good question. How do you start when you're stuck from the start? Yep. Um, I think so. My preference, and actually our method, is we don't start in PowerPoint. We start in a Word document, and we we know the general information that needs to be delivered. And then what we do is we write out what should the slide header be for each of those, you know, for market size, for traction, for team, things like that. And then we go in and we fill out. Okay, what are like just through bullet points underneath that? What is that? What do we need to say about this thing now? And I think if you outline it first before taking it to slides, it's a way easier exercise. And if you force yourself to think about not just what is market size, but what is my assessment of our market size? What's the takeaway thought about our market size? It makes then putting it onto slides a lot easier because you're thinking about not just the raw information, but what is my belief or what do I want to say about this thing? Yeah, that's good. That's good. I like that. Coming up, starting with the, The title slides and headers, I think that's super easy and great way to get going. All right. Anything else we haven't covered? Any last tips about creating your pitch deck? What makes a great deck that we haven't covered? Um, uh, Anything else? I feel like there's probably a ton of stuff in your brain. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a lot. I think maybe just on like a closing note, what I would say is don't, um, how do I put it? Don't uh, put off working on your pitch until you absolutely need to start using it. I think the best situation, the ideal situation is like a full month before you're going to actively start fundraising, you've got your pitch finished and you're now you're polishing it, you're fine tuning it and you're practicing it. So that way the first time you're in front of an investor is not, you know, your first take at it. Yeah, It's something yeah. that you know really well. And then you can start like, doing your roadshow and doing back-to-back pitches and being fine. Um, so, you know, give yourself ample time up front to prepare for it. Which is why, you know, when companies come to us and they're like, we need to raise in the next 25 days or else we're like, sorry, can't work with you. 
I totally agree with that. One of the, I always tell our customers, like, make sure you've given your pitch at least 10, 15 times to people who will rip you apart brutally before getting off there with your first investor, <laughs> you know, yeah. really, yeah, stress testing it. And because, and even those first couple of pitches are probably going to go with investors are probably going to go pretty bad. So don't, mm-hmm. put your, don't put in Dreesen Horowitz, Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins <laughs> as your first three pitches, right? Put <laughs> um Good stuff. If people want to learn more, why don't you get give the URL and any just uh, plug or call to action that you'd like? Yeah, to... for sure. Um, our I think the best specific page on our website to go to would be startuphypeman.com slash fundraising. Um, you can also uh, that's where you'll learn about our methodology and everything. Um, and if you want to meet with us, you can do this. You can do so. Um, we've got a podcast. Nathan has been a guest on it. Um, it's called the Startup Hype Man. The podcast. It's you know available on like literally any podcast platform. And then um, connect with me on LinkedIn as well. Um, Raj Eve Nathan or type in Raj Nation, all one word, I'll pop up. Um, I am almost like annoyingly active on LinkedIn, but you know, a lot of a lot of the content around pitching I, I posted on LinkedIn um, you know, ahead of anywhere else. Excellent. Very good. All right, sir. Lots of good stuff here. I always judge an episode based on how many notes I've taken <laughs> and I've Front got and tons back. of notes. So um <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much. People, check it out. Uh, StartupNation.com forward slash... StartupHypeMan.com. Oh, what am I saying? Startup you combined to me with Raj Nation. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm mixing up. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, enjoy the rest of your summer there in Chicago. Appreciate it. Thank you, Nathan. Over now.